In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you and glorify you. We give you thanks and praise and glory for your greatness, for your goodness, for your kindness, for your gentleness. For most of all, Lord God, your patience with us. Father in heaven, at this very moment, we just want to give you thanks and praise for the opportunity you have given us to be together, to fellowship with one another and the Holy Spirit. At this very moment, Spirit of God, take complete control of this proceedings of this class. Especially, Lord, as I speak the word, nothing of me, everything of you, anoint my heart, my lips, my tongue, my vocal cords. Allow every word that we speak in this class to be anointed of the Holy Spirit. Make this teaching practical and easy for us to understand so that applying every day what we learn, we can live the victorious life that Jesus has given us. We praise you and thank you, Father, for all this. In Jesus' name, amen. So my dear brothers and sisters, welcome once again. We today are reflecting not on Matthew 13, or on 14, but we are jumping straight away to Matthew 20, because today we are honoring two great saints, two great apostles, two great disciples of Jesus, James and John. And today on this feast day, when we celebrate the feast of these two big saints, or great saints, let us see from where they came, where they were really in their, in their relationship with God, even though they were with Jesus. And we find that when we look back now over 2000 years, what great disciples these two men turned out to be, James and John. But that is not how they started. They started very much in the flesh. They started very much being so worldly in their thinking. They even wanted positions of authority just like everyone in this world, ambitious to go higher and higher in the same way these two disciples, these two brothers wanted to be ambitious in order to get positions even with Jesus in his kingdom. We pick up the gospel today, Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28. We'll start with verse number 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked a favor of him. Now in this gospel, we read that the mother of James and John turned out to be the spokeswoman for her two sons in the book of Matthew, which we are going to reflect on today. But if we go to the gospel of Mark, we find in Mark's gospel, James and John approached directly Jesus with the question in order to get the positions in one to his right and one to his left. Now, when you read Matthew and you read Mark, the two synoptic gospels, you think, why is there conflict? Why in one place the mother is asking and in another place only these two brothers are asking? In fact, brothers and sisters, there is no contradiction here. There is no conflict here. All the three that is the two sons, James and John, along with their mother, they actually discussed among themselves for sure. They collaborated, they planned this all so that they could come to Jesus and make the request to Jesus. So all three of them were equally responsible for what they were doing. But here in Matthew, it is mentioned that the mother comes to Jesus requesting for her two sons to get a position, one on the right and one on the left, when Jesus is anointed king in his kingdom. And you know, brothers and sisters, if we read Mark chapter 5, verse 40, and again, if we read Matthew chapter 27, verse 56, we'll find out that the mother of James and John was Salome. That's her name. And only when you look at these two verses, you will realize that her, this lady, this, this uh, mother was actually present 
with Jesus' mother Mary and Mary Magdalene at the cross. Can you imagine this is the same woman who came to, her, to Jesus during his ministry days in order to get her sons a position on the right and a position on the left. Why? Because she was ambitious for her sons. She wanted her sons to have some position of power, some position of authority when Jesus was really in his kingdom. And now we come to know that it was Salome, the mother of James and John, along with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who were there at the cross when Jesus was crucified. So you can imagine the transformation that took place in Salome. We know what happened to James and John, but this was not what happened to them when they started their journey with Jesus. Their, their journey with Jesus was only one of ambition, one wanting authority, one wanting control, one wanting fame and name. But the same people were transformed and now they went right up to the cross in spite of all the restriction that women had in being with men, all the dangers that were involved following the Roman soldiers along with Jesus right up to the cross. Now let us look at this very important point, brothers and sisters. The mother of these two disciples, according to verse 20, she comes kneeling and falls kneeling and on her feet at, the, at, at Jesus, in front of Jesus. And she tells Jesus, I want you to grant me a favor. I want you to do me something special because these two sons of mine are your disciples. They belong to your inner circle. And you know, brothers and sisters, when you look at what Salome, the mother of James and John did, you will definitely be quite impressed. Anybody there would have definitely thought this woman was a woman of, of worship. She was a woman who was very humble. But just look at the request that you see in verse number 21. In verse number 21, this request is not about, you know, she's come there in order to, for, to bless somebody. She's not come there to ask Jesus to heal somebody. She's not come there in order to get anything from Jesus. She's come only in order to get her sons a higher position a position of authority, one on the right and one on the left. Remember, if we are worshiping God to exalt ourselves, all our external acts may surely look very good on the outside, but in front of God, no one can fool God. We must remember there are many people, even today, who respectfully, very humbly, Especially, you know, you find the people who, who really are poor, those who are looking for a job, those who want a favor from someone in authority. They will come so respectfully. They will come so humbly. They'll come so much with tears. They'll actually fall on their feet and they will come in, in an act of worship to somebody else. And people, when they see that being done, they will think that, look at this person giving me so much of respect, giving me so much of honor, giving me so much of, you know, credit that they are taken up by this sort of an external act that they now become so generous. They become so, they get overawed by what has been done to them. And now they are, even though they may not, you know, be in a position, but they will want to do something for someone who really acts that way. But brothers and sisters, no one can ever fool God. Remember, God looks at the heart. He's not looking at the outside. First book of Samuel, chapter 16, verse 7 says that man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. So whenever we come in worship to the Lord, we need to ask ourselves this question. Why am I worshiping the Lord? Why am I kneeling down? Why am I humbling myself to the Lord? Am I coming to him in order to get something from him? Am I coming in the presence of the Lord in order to make request of him? Am I coming in the presence of the Lord in order to ask him something for my own self? Remember, brothers and sisters, God knows our heart. God knows our inside. No one, absolutely no one, can ever come in the presence of God 
trying to put an act, trying to act like a Pharisee, showing everybody on the outside how faithful, how holy they are. Because God can see the inside of us, whereas man can see on the outside. And when, when, the, when the mother of James and John comes kneeling down in front of Jesus, asking for a request for her sons, the Lord immediately recognizes that this worship that the mother of James and John is giving him is not a genuine worship. She's not come there with any intentions of good for herself or good for mankind. She is come with a sole intention of selfishness. She's come only for her sons so that her sons will get a position of authority, will be exalted in the kingdom of God. And remember, brothers and sisters, at the start of this reflection of today's gospel, we must remember, if we are coming in the presence of the Lord, we are coming there to worship him for who he is. We are coming in the presence of God to worship him for who he is. We are not coming in the presence of God to worship him only to receive from him. Remember, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. If we are coming, humbling ourselves, you know, doing all sorts of spiritual exercises only to receive from God. Remember, God is surely going to give it to us. There's no doubt about it. But are we growing into a relationship with this God? Are we really growing into a relationship with Jesus? Are we beginning to know him day by day? Are we beginning to understand the heart of God? And are we really knowing this God receiving all his instructions, receiving all the wisdom from God, getting all the revelations of God, so that now we can go and share these revelations. We can go out and be servants in his kingdom. Are we doing that or are we doing it for our own selfish purpose? This is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Remember, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we all like to pray. We all come in the presence of Lord in times of prayer. There are some of us who will pray three, four, five times a day. There will be special moments of prayer in a day. What is that you and I do when we come in the presence of the Lord in prayer? What is it that we do during all that time in prayer? Is it all about asking? Is it all about requesting? Is it all about you know wanting this, wanting that, needing this, putting all the requests? Or are we just coming in the presence of the Lord and saying to him, Lord, what can I do for you? What are your instructions for me? You are my Lord. I want you to give me instructions. I want you to tell me, what do you want me to do with my life? What is it that you have in store for me? What can I do for you? This is the question that somebody lies low in front of God so that God can lift us up and use us for his kingdom. Verse number 21. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Now in verse number 21, brothers and sisters, what we read here is also mentioned in Mark chapter 10 verses 35 to 45. In Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45, the same incident where Salome, the mother of James and John, goes to Jesus, where she is not mentioned, but only the two disciples, James and John, asking this to Jesus. Now, Jesus does not promise what to do to the mother of James and John for what she asked them. The external act of worship that Salome did for Jesus before all was perfect. There's no doubt that she humbled herself, but the desires that she had were not good. And so Jesus did not promise Salome anything without knowing what was the request was. Remember, brothers and sisters, someone comes to Jesus, someone comes to us and says, I want you to do something for me. Remember, before you can say, don't worry, I can do everything for you. It is important for us to know what the request really is. Jesus, before he can give an answer 
to Salome regarding her sons because she comes and says, I want you to do me a favor. What does Jesus say? He just tells her, what can I do for you? What is your request? This, brothers and sisters, shows the great wisdom of Jesus. Jesus could only operate in wisdom because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had come into Jesus. Remember, Jesus is God, but he came on earth as 100% as man. And he had to receive the Holy Spirit through the anointing at the time of his baptism. But the same Jesus, even though he's God, even though he has the Holy Spirit in him, he asked Salome, what can I do for you? I want to know what your request is. I'm not just going to say to you, because you worshipped me, I'm going to do everything for you. Remember, brothers and sisters, you and I can come in the presence of God. We can worship him. We can do a lot of prayers, a lot of spiritual exercises. But let us make our request to God according to his word, according to his promise, according to what is written down in the will of God. Remember, you can fast and pray and do all sorts of exercises. And even what people do is storm heavens. But if it is not according to God's will, we can spend hours and days and months and years praying. We will never re receive that request if it is not according to God's will. Remember, God will always answer everything according to his will. Now, remember, Jesus had the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus has the Holy Spirit, instead of just blindly telling her, I can do it for you, he tells her, hold on. I want to know what is your request. Remember, there was a king by the name of Herod. And Herod did not have the Holy Spirit. So what happens? A time comes in Matthew chapter 14, verse 7 to 11. The daughter of Herodias. Now Herodias was the wife of Philip, Herod's brother. So the, the, the brother's wife had got married to Herod. And now Herodias had a daughter from Philip who came and danced before King Herod. And when she, he danced before King Herod in front of all his courtiers and all his officials, Herod was so taken up that he actually promised Herodias' daughter, I will give you anything you want, anything you ask. And you know what this girl does? She goes to her mother and she says, the king has asked me anything I can give. And the mother, because she was so jealous, because John the Baptist had actually, in fact, criticized the king for marrying his brother's wife, she tells her daughter to go and ask the king for the head of John the Baptist. And what happens? John the Baptist is now killed, he's beheaded because of a stupid request made by the daughter of Herodias. Remember, it was, a, it, was, it was John the Baptist who was responsible for the, for the complete revival of Israel. He was a godly man. For someone who's dancing and doing all sorts of obscene dancing in front of a king, gets a request for the head of John the Baptist, only goes to show you what happens when people do not have the Holy Spirit, people do not have the wisdom of God. They make such foolish decisions. They make such foolish commitments that when they make these commitments, they cannot keep these commitments. And that is exactly what happened in the case of Herod. Jesus, when he gets a request, even though the mother of James and John comes on her knees, worshiping Jesus, Jesus immediately recognizes that this mother has not come with something according to God's will, and he declines her request. Verse number 22. So in verse number 22, brothers and sisters, it talks about the cup that Jesus is, is going to actually offer James and John. Let us read verse number 22. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, we are able. 
Brothers and sisters, Jesus does not reply to the mother's request. Jesus doesn't give an answer. What does he do? He talks about a cup of suffering. He talks about a cup that they are going to drink. And what is the cup? The word cup here in this passage comes from the Greek word poterion, poterion, denoting a drinking vessel. And you know, brothers and sisters, in the Jewish times, a cup had a metaphor for the word, the word cup was a metaphor to describe for something which somebody was undergoing or somebody was experiencing. For example, it is mentioned in Psalm 116 verse three, the cup of salvation. That's what it says, the cup of salvation, Psalm 116 verse three. Then it talks about the cup of joy in Psalm 23 verse five. Many of you know that Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23 verse five talks about the cup of joy. Then in Psalm 11 verse six, it talks about a cup of punishment. A cup of punishment, Psalm 11 verse six. Then it talks about a cup of anger, the cup of wrath. Again, in Isaiah 51 verse 17, and Psalm 75 verse eight. It talks about the cup of blessing. That's what St. Paul writes about in the first book of Corinthians chapter 10 verse six and so on. There are so many cups that God is talking about in his word. So this word cup is used in the New Testament for the suffering of Christ. Jesus talks about the cup of suffering in Matthew chapter 20, verse 22, and again in John chapter 18, verse 11. I can give you these verses later. For now, you need to understand the cup represents something that someone has to undergo or something that someone has to experience. It basically is a metaphor which the Jewish people used for anything that they were going to experience or undergo in their life whether it was anger, whether it was joy, whether it was suffering, whether it was the wrath of God, or whether it was even the blessings of God. And here, brothers and sisters, Jesus applied the word cup for to himself, for he was willingly going to suffer the cup of suffering of, for God's judgment for our sins. That is what Jesus came on this, on this world. He came to drink the cup of suffering which he had to go for the sins of the whole human race. Remember, Jesus had to drink the cup of suffering for you and me so that now we could receive salvation after Jesus had gone to the cross. And James and John were also going to suffer and share in Christ's suffering. That's what Jesus is talking about in this verse number 22. He's saying, are you ready to drink the cup of suffering, which I am going to drink. Remember, James and John also drank the cup of suffering. They suffered even unto death. But remember, brothers and sisters, the suffering that James and John went through, it was not a redemptive suffering. Only redemptive suffering was who went through on the cross was Jesus. Jesus was the spotless son of God. Remember, brothers and sisters, in order for that sacrifice to be perfected before the whole heavenly father, the lamp of God had to be spotless. The lamp of God had to be without sin. The lamp of God had to be without any blemish. And the only person who walked on this earth without sin, without blemish, without any fault, without any error before God was only Jesus. So if anyone is preaching today that you and I need to go for redemptive suffering, remember Jesus has already paid the price for our sufferings. He has already paid the price for our sins. He's already paid the price for everything that you and I need to suffer because he was the spotless son of God. There is no suffering that you and I need to go in this world except the suffering of persecution. Remember the only suffering that a Christian needs to go in this life is the suffering of persecution. We have not been redeemed from only one thing. We have not been redeemed 
from persecution. Persecution for our faith in Jesus Christ. So when you are a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, when you truly believe in him, you are going to be persecuted. That's what it says in 2 Tim Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. The godly will suffer persecution. All those who are godly, all those who are walking according to God's will, according to God's word, who are following Jesus, they will be persecuted. And therefore, brothers and sisters, persecution is the birthright of every Christian. Remember, if you are a Christian, persecution is your birthright. If you are not being persecuted, it's either because you are living an ungodly life. That's what it says. Only those who are godly will be persecuted. Jesus knew that these disciples of his would be plunged into the same sufferings that he would be experienced. And that's what happened to them. That's what happened to James and John. That's what happened to all the apostles. They were persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. And all the apostles, they eventually were martyred for their faith in Jesus. That's what it says, brothers and sisters. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus says, Blessed are you when you are persecuted, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when you are persecuted, for yours is the kingdom of God. So if you belong to the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters, persecution for, the, for our faith in Jesus is something that we should endure. There are times we need to avoid it. And there are times the Holy Spirit will tell us to endure that suffering only because he wants us in order to endure it, to bring other souls into the kingdom. Verse number 23. He said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. Now, as we read verse number 23, we see that these two brothers, James and John, wanted positions of honor, wanted positions of authority next to Jesus. Absolutely fine, no problem. But instead of they being granted those positions, because it was never given to them, it was never destined for them, what do they get? They were granted positions of suffering, as this verse says, they were given, the, the, the response that Jesus gave them was a response of suffering. You know, brothers and sisters, even today, there are so many people who work in ministries. There are so many people who have got ministries of their own. They have ministries in which they go out sharing God's word. And if you can see today, you look at the television, you look at the internet, you look at, you know, all the matter that is available on the internet, you will find so many people are there who have got the ministries of their own. Each one is starting their own ministry, trying to share God's word. And there are people who follow these ministers, they follow these leaders, and now in order to impress these leaders, they will actually trample upon even other people in order to get positions of authority, get positions of, you know, positions where they are close to the leader so that they can impress their leaders. And if that leader is not truly a godly leader, if that person is truly not person who is being led by the spirit and being led by the flesh, what happens? The people who actually are surrounding him are people who are actually growing, instead of growing in the spirit, are growing in the flesh. They are being used in order to do all the dirty work of the, of the leader. And as a result, you find a lot of people, instead of getting blessed in that ministry, are only turning out to be a ministry of collection of money, collection of funds, collection of a lot of resources. And it's all becoming a, a ministry of the flesh. There is no real change taking place in this world. If you really understand, brothers and sisters, a person who's been guided by the Holy Spirit, a person who's guided by the, by the word of God will be somebody who will really make an impact in the lives of people. He will be one who will come under persecution. He will be rejected. He will be, throw, he will be set apart. But important thing is, he is not going to be cowed down or going to be you know, stopped 
because of the response of people. He is still going to go to the finishing line because God has called him in order to do his work. Remember, a minister who's called in order to do God's work is not looking to people for encouragement. He's not looking for people's, uh, you, know, you know, encouragement or probably people's opinion in order to be driven in his ministry. A person who's been guided by the Holy Spirit a person who is truly doing what God has called him to do now will definitely make an impact in God's kingdom. You know, brothers and sisters, the truth is great things do not come without suffering. Great things do not happen without suffering. In fact, St. Peter in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he writes something very beautifully. Let us read that. First book of Peter, chapter 3, verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. It is for this reason you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. Remember, we don't give evil for evil, bad for bad. We always return good for evil. When somebody comes against us, we always return to them with good. Why? Because the word of God says that is our calling. If you are a Christian, if you truly believe in Jesus, your calling and my calling is in order to receive the flake, receive all this rejection, receive the persecution. And at the same time, Return whatever is done to us in evil, return it with good, return with love, return the best we can ever do because we have been filled with the love of God. Remember, brothers and sisters, when we return good for evil, the word of God says we inherit a blessing. But we must know that God is not the cause of that suffering. Remember, God is not the author of suffering. He's not the author of sickness. He's not the author of all these things that people come against you. We must understand it is Satan. And a fallen world without Christ will always cause it and create it. Opposition will always come when we walk in the spirit, brothers and sisters. Those who walk in a godly way will be persecuted. That's what we saw. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. The godly will be persecuted. And so brothers and sisters, when we understand this, when we understand the truth, that persecution is going to come as long as you believe in Jesus, you will be encouraged to overcome that persecution. You'll be encouraged to return that persecution and that rejection with love, with good, so that we can inherit a blessing in God's kingdom. Verse number 24. When the ten heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. When the ten other disciples, because these two brothers had wanting positions of authority. They had actually brought their mother in order to talk to Jesus. So when the other ten disciples heard, they saw what was happening, that these two brothers want position, one on the right and the left. They were angry. It was pride, it was self-glory, and it was the self that caused these two brothers, James and John, to seek positions in God's kingdom. Remember, brothers and sisters, it was only pride. They had pride in them. Probably they thought that, you know, they were much better off than the other disciples. Maybe James and John had, you know, probably were more educated. We don't know. We don't have any much idea of whether they had more clout or whether they had more social standing, but they wanted positions of authority with Jesus. And now when these 10 disciples see all this drama taking place right in front of their eyes, they become very angry. You know, brothers and sisters, these two brothers, along with the other 10, had still not fully grasped Jesus's ministry and purpose and although they were going about with Jesus, in Jesus' ministry, doing all their work, their hearts were full of worldly ambition. Their hearts were full with what they could get in this world. They were so focused on their self and earthly future that they failed to understand. They failed to grasp what Jesus had really come for. The other disciples who were also upset with James and John, they also were in pride. 
Why? Because they were upset why these two brothers were still, you know, interested in positions. They all were still not looking at their master, Jesus, but their own selves. Remember, pride always comes when there is contention. When there is contention, there's always going to be problems. Let us read Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. By insolence, the heedless make strife, but wisdom is with those who take advice. Wisdom comes from those who take advice. But as those who are insolent, those who are proud, they are definitely going to bring a lot of contention. There's going to be a lot of contention when there is pride. Remember, brothers and sisters, this is why we must never look up to a human being or to human leaders, whether they are spiritual or whether they are secular, to be inspired to live a godly life. Remember, many a times people look up to, you know, human people, look up to somebody in position, look at to somebody's external holiness and try to get inspired by them. The only way, the only way for us to be inspired is to be inspired by the word of God, to be inspired by looking at Jesus, because Jesus is perfect. His justice is fair, and his rules are same for everyone. Remember, God's laws do not have any partiality. God has no favorites. He does not see based on what we do on the outside. He is looking at everybody on the inside. He is looking at our hearts. There is a person, a human being, even though he may be a very godly person, even though he may be very, still there is some sort of error in that person, including myself. We all have got our own flaw, faults. We have got our own weaknesses. But when it comes to the word, when it comes to God, God is perfect. His word is perfect. There is nobody who can ever be perfect as much as God is. And that's why he says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And we can only be perfect when we believe God's word. Remember, brothers and sisters, there is not a single human being who's walked on this earth, apart from Jesus, who's walked in perfection. So why look at human people and get inspired? There is somebody who walked on this earth who showed us how to walk in perfection, and that is Jesus. He has given us his word. He has given us the gospel. He has given us his promises. It is for us good enough to look at Jesus and his word in order to gain perfection, in order to be inspired, then to look at a human being, to look at somebody on the outside and get fooled and be totally messed up in our life. Verse number 25. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. So here, Jesus is comparing the kingdom of this world to his own kingdom. Remember, brothers and sisters, God's kingdom and the world system are operated in different directions. They are absolutely opposite of each other. Earthly rulers lord it over their subjects. But in God's kingdom, the great ones have an attitude of a servant. What a different change. In the world, you will find if there is a boss or there is somebody in authority, whether it's a religious leader, whether it is a, you know, a secular leader, they always want to have a position of authority where they actually start ordering their subjects to do the job. And that's exactly how it works in this world. But in God's kingdom, Jesus showed us with his own example, especially in John chapter 13, verses 12 to 17. Let us read that. John chapter 13, Verses 12 to 17, Jesus is showing us his own example of humility. He's showing us his own example of servanthood. He's just showing us how we should deal with when we walk as true disciples of his. John chapter 13, verses 12 to 17. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. 
Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. You know, brothers and sisters, washing the feet of someone was a very, very slave's job. Only a slave in the Old Testament would wash the feet of somebody else. Jesus is the Lord of Lords. He's the creator. Does he need to wash the feet of his disciples? But he does that. He washes their feet and then he teaches them. He says, as much as I am the Lord and master and the creator of this whole universe can wash your feet, it is important for you to learn how to wash one another's feet. Now remember brothers and sisters, once a year, on Monday, Thursday, we wash the feet of our disciples. We wash the feet of 12 people. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. Just take once a year, just Jesus to wash the feet of his disciples once a year and we wash their feet. You can nicely put wash, wash, wash feet of somebody over, over 12 feet and that's, that could be it. But that is only symbolic. What is Jesus talking about washing the feet of his disciples? And what is he saying to his disciples that we should wash each other's feet? Are we supposed to go to somebody's house and say, you know, please, Jesus wash the feet. I want to wash your feet as well. This is not what it's saying. Remember, brothers and sisters, when Jesus talks about washing the feet of one another, he's talking about taking the burdens, taking the pains, taking the sufferings of one another, helping others to alleviate their sufferings. It's not about, you know, just very symbolically, we go to somebody's house and wash their feet and we say, Jesus said to wash their feet. So once a year, I'll wash somebody's feet. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about every single moment to look for opportunities to be a blessing to somebody. Remember, if you and I are disciples of the kingdom of God, if we truly believe in Jesus, we need to look for opportunities to be a blessing to someone else. Let me say this again. If you and I are disciples in the kingdom of God, we truly believe in Jesus, then what Jesus says in John chapter, uh, where does he say that? In John, what did we read that? John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, Jesus says that, you know, if I have washed your feet, you also need to wash. John chapter 13 verses 12 to 17. Since I have washed your feet, you also need to wash one another's feet. Brothers and sisters, Washing each other's feet is not supposed to be literally washing feet. It is about reaching out to people whose sufferings you and I can alleviate, can reduce, can give a helping hand so that now we can bring them into some sort of, you know, a comfort for all the suffering that they are going through. What is the use of going and, you know, talking a lot, but not really being a blessing to somebody else? What is the use of us, brothers and sisters, if we say we are disciples of Lord Jesus and we are not going out and trying to be a blessing to especially those who belong to the family of God? It is important for us to reach out and be a blessing to one another. Verse number 26. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Now, brothers and sisters, the word servant comes from the Greek word diakonos. I want to say this again. The word servant, which has been translated in verse 26, comes from the Greek word diakonos, which simply means he is a waiter. It comes, the word deacon in the church is coming from this word diakonos which is nothing but simply a waiter. If we want to be great in God's kingdom, we have to simply serve others. Remember, that is the job of every single disciple in the kingdom of God. We are called to be servants to one another. We are called to wash each other's feet. We are called to alleviate the suffering of others. We are called to show some heart, some love to those who are suffering so that their pain and their suffering can be alleviated. And this is what the word servant, diakonos, or the word deacon, which comes in the church, which is simply serving one another. And we've got such great examples in our own time is our own Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Verse number 27. 
and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave whoever wishes to be first must be your slave how is it possible brothers and sisters if anybody wants to be first he must be a slave and we begin to wonder what is jesus talking about how is this really possible those who have been given authority are called to rule and we all know this suppose somebody has given a position of authority can you imagine that person being a slave instead of being served instead of giving the orders he is going to start working for them so what is the position of authority what jesus is saying here looks like it is weakness it looks like the person is very weak he is not a leader how could this work brothers and sisters how can someone say that in order to be rising up in the kingdom of god he needs to be a slave let us read this verse again verse number 27 and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave if anyone wishes to be first among you he must be a slave first and foremost brothers and sisters it takes faith to humble ourselves and let god exalt and promote us then we are to promote and exalt ourselves like i want to repeat this line it takes faith in god to humble ourselves and allow god to exalt us allow god to promote us then we ourselves promoting ourselves and exalting ourselves when we do that we are simply operating in the flesh in the flesh it is harder brothers and sisters to trust god and to lean on our own understanding when we operate in the flesh when we operate without god's word without operating in the spirit it's very easy i just want to take control i want to be in charge i want to be the boss but here is the truth serving others does not mean you let others walk over you and the position which god has given you of authority remember it's not someone's going to walk over you or over that position god has placed you in a position let us read what saint peter is writing when he writes in the fifth book first book of peter chapter 5 verses 2 to 5 let us read that and see what saint peter explains when he talks about this subject to tend the flock of god that is in your charge exercising the oversight not under compulsion but willingly as god would have you do it not for sordid gain but eagerly do not lord it over those in your charge but be examples to the flock and when the chief shepherd appears you will win the crown of glory that never fades away in the same way you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders so here saint peter is talking about that when we are given a charge over the church of god when we are people who are our flock when we are the shepherds of the flock we are supposed to not lord it over them on the contrary we are called to take care of the flock we are to operate in love brothers and sisters in order to be a shepherd you yourself must be in touch with the chief shepherd how can someone shepherd a church if he himself is not having any relationship with the chief shepherd jesus christ and when a person has really a relationship with the chief shepherd he can now give directions in order to shepherd the flock and that's what jesus says when the chief shepherd comes he will give them a crown which will never fade away remember it's not the position that decides how i'm going to run the church how i'm going to run the community all depends on how much is my relationship with the chief shepherd and when the chief shepherd's relation is strong the chief shepherd is going to give me direction the holy spirit is going to give me direction the holy spirit is going to direct me in order to minister to my flock and when the flock are ministered directly by the chief shepherd through the shepherd who has been appointed on this earth there is going to be great revival there is going to be a change in that there is going to be a total revival there is going to be a change in the church remember brothers and sisters the crown that jesus is going to give us is going to be a crown that will never fade away god admonished 
the leaders of the seven churches of Asia. If you read that in the Revel in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter two, verses fourteen to sixteen, and then again verses twenty to twenty-three. We won't read that today. Even the leaders of the seven churches of Asia, according to the book of Revelation, those leaders were admonished by God because they failed to be the good leaders. What did Paul do? He was also admonishing the church in Corinth in first book of Corinth, chapter four, verses 18 to 20. And then again, chapter five, verses one to 13. And again, when he talked to Timothy in Timothy, one Timothy, one to 20, I'm not giving you, I'm just running through the scriptures only to tell you brothers and sisters that these leaders, Paul, even the leaders of the church, they were admonished. And Paul was not ready to be only a goody goody person. He was not interested to be a man pleaser. Paul was very candid and even admonished the people who were entrusted to his care. Remember brothers and sisters, if a person truly loves the Lord, if a person is truly in touch with the good shepherd, the shepherd will always admonish his sheep. He will always want his sheep to go along the path because the path that the shepherd wants is a path of protection, a path of holiness, a path where he wants his sheep in order to gain that life which God has promised us. And so when the shepherd actually admonishes his congregation, not worrying whether they will go away, whether they'll be angry, whether they'll feel bad, whether they will be hurt, he's only doing his job, but doing it with love. Remember, when a shepherd truly does his job with love, understanding that it is God himself who's speaking to him to tell the people who are entrusted to him so that they will know the truth. The people may get upset, may get hurt, but the truth which they will learn will save the person's soul. It all comes down to attitude, brothers and sisters. If we use other people for our own selfish purpose, to advance ourselves for our own self-glory, that is absolutely wrong. God wants us in order to advance his kingdom. He wants us to add souls who will truly be committed to him, who will be committed to their relationship with the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. Let us look at Galatians chapter four, verse 16, and see what St. Paul tells the people of Galatia. Remember, St. Paul did not mince his words. St. Paul was very straight and to the point when he saw something wrong. Let us read what he says to Galatia in Galatians chapter 4, verse 16 to the people of Galatia. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? That's what St. Paul is saying. People used to love St. Paul. But when St. Paul saw that in spite of the preaching of the gospel, people were still operating in the flesh. They had still not built up their relationship with Jesus. They were just going about the day-to-day -day work as though nothing was really happening to them. St. Paul observed that the chief shepherd gave him this response and he told him, please tell the people of Galatia, have I become your enemy now because I'm telling you the truth? Have I become someone who you need to keep aloof because the truth is hurting you? Let the truth hurt you so that when the truth hurts you, you will at least make that change and now you will repent and have a relationship with Jesus. Remember, brothers and sisters, the proper attitude is to use our position to serve others and not ourselves. We must use our position so that we can bring souls into the kingdom. Even if we have to tell somebody the truth, then our actions are justified, even when expressed in discipline and in rebuke. That's what it is even when we discipline somebody, even when we rebuke somebody, but when this thing will be justified before God because our actions are only meant to save that soul. It should be done out of love. It should be done with the right attitude. Let us look again at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, it says, do not hide from your brother. If you have to tell your brother that he's doing something wrong, please tell him that he's doing something wrong. Don't hide it from him. Leviticus 19, verse 17. You shall not hate in your heart anyone of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. He says, do not hate your brother. 
by hiding the truth. If you know somebody is doing something wrong, it is better for you to reprove your brother, reprove your neighbor, tell him, rebuke him. Don't be stopped to avoid telling somebody that doing something wrong because you are afraid of your relationship. You are afraid of your friendship being affected. You are afraid that they will reject you for telling them the truth. Remember, it is better for you to be rejected by men than to be rejected by God. When God tells you to speak, when God tells you to open your mouth and tell your neighbor and tell your friend and tell your relatives that they're doing something wrong, you have done the part that God has told you. Now it is left to that person to hear that word, to make the correction and now live a godly life or to reject God and reject the Holy Spirit. And when they do that, you are no more responsible because you have done your part of telling them the truth. But remember, if God tells you to tell the truth to somebody, to tell your loved one that they should change, that they should do this, you must do it irrespective of the consequences of your relationship with them. Remember, brothers and sisters, genuine servants put others' interests first instead of their own, even if they are rejected. Even when they are rejected, a genuine servant will always put the interest of others. The greatest example we have, the greatest, whoever walked on this earth is Jesus himself. Let us see what Philipp St. Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 5. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let the same mind be in you that was of Christ Jesus. And what was the mind of Christ? He humbled himself even to death on the cross, obey, obeying the Father. Remember, brothers and sisters, if we are ready to obey God, when we get an instruction from the Lord according to his word, and we do what his word says, I tell you, brothers and sisters, it is better to be a God pleaser than to be a man pleaser. Even if your relationship with your loved ones and your family and even your friends is going to be affected because you have told them the truth, so be it. Remember, God will be pleased with you because you have to live with God for all eternity. If people are going to reject Christ and you are going to be a man pleaser and stop the truth, remember, God is going to hold you accountable. You are going to be affected in your own relationship with the Lord. You want revelation. You want to live a godly life. You want to live a holy life. You are going to face persecution. But at the same time, there is a crown that is going to be given to you and me, which will never fade because you and I chose to do what God told you and me to do. When we do what he says, when we truly become genuine servants, we will always put the interest of others. And what is that interest of others? Not just about they getting you know, a, a higher position or being more comfortable. It's about they knowing the truth and getting into a relationship with Jesus himself. Verse number 28. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So we have already seen earlier, brothers and sisters, <laughs> that a servant means a waiter. A servant is nothing but a waiter. Jesus did not come to be served and to be waited upon, but he came to serve and to wait on us. Can you imagine this God who loves you and me came to earth to serve you and me, to wait on you and me. What an awesome God we have. What a God we serve brothers and sisters when we understand that this God, the creator of heaven and earth, came on this earth to serve you and me, we truly can understand what Christianity is all about. Remember, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is not like any other faith. In Christianity, God himself has done everything for us. God himself has served us the buffet. God himself has served us the entire table. He has done everything for us. We only need to believe what he has done and receive it as a free gift. In the case of other faiths, which are not really true faiths, people have to slog it out, have to sweat, they have to fast, they have to pray, they have to storm the heaven, they have to do something to please an angry God. And that is all over. All we need to do is 
what God has already done. He has served us. He has waited on us and he still waits on us to believe what his son did and receive everything in his kingdom. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for giving us the understanding of what true servanthood is. You loving father sent your son Jesus into this world and Jesus you obeyed the father unto death. You served your people. You waited on us. You went to the cross and opened up heaven for us as our eternal home. Today, as we believe you, Lord Jesus, as our Lord God and master, as we believe Lord Jesus, you who have saved us and given everything for us in the kingdom of God, help us to truly walk this life as true servants. Help us to walk, Lord, not in positions of authority, positions of name and fame, but walk the path of humility, walk the path of service so that we can truly be your disciples. We can truly walk to that crown of glory that is waiting for us, a crown that shall never ever fade. We thank you and praise you, Father, for this understanding in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen.